code on this computer. All good. Stage is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so today I'm going to be giving um, an introduction to functional programming in C Sharp, and specifically using a library I built uh, called LanguageX. Um, but before we get to that point, we need a shared understanding uh, of why we'd even bother. I mean, who cares, right? We're all writing code today. Uh, why should we learn anything new? Uh, it's not possible for me to teach you everything about functional programming in an hour, and it requires a different way of thinking about code. Um, it's a different mindset. This mindset takes a while to acquire, even for the most experienced of programmers. Um, and so I'll be taking, uh, uh, talking a little about the philosophy of this idea and generally asking questions about what we think software engineering even is. Um, this is to provoke you into considering why, whether, whether the OO way is the right way um, and to help you, uh, give, some, you know, give, give you some of the questions to ask yourself when taking this journey. Um, by the end of this talk, you will hopefully be taking your first steps into the functional paradigm but also the functional way of, of thinking about code. If you've already taken those first steps, I'll be presenting you with some ideas will help you understand what we're trying to achieve. Uh, ultimately, this is all about trying to write more expressive and robust programs. And if you follow these techniques, I believe you will. Um, but first I wanna just talk a little bit about false profits in our industry. We are bombarded with opinions from many who want to make a name for themselves and become kind of superstars of tech. It's like pop idol for programmers um, and it's pervasive in our industry. We should always ask, quite, always question the motives of anyone that does this. And yes, even my motives for this talk. Uh, and we should always look at these opinions with a, with a critical eye. The reason I raise this is because I believe the field object oriented programming uh, is beset with dogma. Uh, much of it isn't provably correct. Not that it isn't necessarily correct, but you know, there's no there's no kind of real proofs behind behind this stuff, um, and they're repeated endlessly as uh, as mantras of how we should write code. An example of, of of this is the Design Patterns book, which I'm sure a lot of people have seen um, by the Gang of Four, and they're some of the most vocal prophets of our industry. And what they say has a significant impact on the way that people think about writing code. But what are their motives? Is it to sell books, to sell the consultancy services, um, or to help push software engineering forwards? Are they right? Who knows? They certainly talk a good game, but is there any proof? Look, software engineering is hard. And I've always said it's part science, part craft, and partially art. And because of that, I don't think we really know what software engineering is yet. Yes, we are talking to the computer, but we're also talking to each other. Um, and we have different types of language, different type systems, dynamically typed, statically typed, dependently typed, refined types, different syntax styles, white space significant, curly braces, lisps. We have different paradigms, procedural, object oriented, functional. And we have opinionated libraries, often with conflicting ideologies or, and approaches. So who's right? Are they all right? Are they all right, but in different use cases? Or are some of them fundamentally broken? Do we even have the ability to judge? And therefore, how do we judge the so-called industry gurus? I'd say with an enormous pinch of salt. So why listen to me? I've always said to my junior programmers who want my advice, don't listen to me, I'm probably talking nonsense. And although that's a tongue in cheek phrase, I kind of mean it. What I really mean is you should be, be able to make your own judgments on this, not just take my word for it. Uh, I may be sat here with 36 years of programming experience and that certainly has value, but I'm in the same place as everybody else, still wondering what software engineering actually is and the best way to do it. So are we there yet? Even though functional programming is getting ever more popular, OO is the mainstream. OO is one. But is OO really the best way to write software? Is this it for software engineering? Is software engineering getting any easier? If it was getting easier, that might be a sign that we're on the right path. Do we have fewer bugs? Is complexity decreasing? I don't believe so. We should at least consider the possibility that we're not there yet. <clears throat> so this is a, a timeline of software engineering paradigms. It's obviously not a real timeline, 
uh, in the, uh, you know, because something like, you know, functional programming, for example, that, that came along in the 60s, so that would be kind of halfway through this list. Um, but it's probably a reasonable timeline of software engineering paradigms uh, uh, in industry, in the mainstream. And you can see how each, each one of these steps in, uh, uh, in paradigm um, was a step up in abstraction. You know, switches were captured by holes in punch cards. Um, the holes in the punch cards were captured by uh, uh, numbers in machine code. The, the numbers were captured by three letter uh, um, mnemonics for assembly language and procedure, uh, procedures kind of captured uh, the mnemonics and gave them names. And you can see how each, as, as we go on, you know, these, these levels, levels of abstraction make it easier for us to write code. And it may, allows us uh, a greater level of productivity, right? If we had to write modern applications with punch cards, <laughs> you'd really struggle, right? And, and, but even you know, assembly language, if you were trying to write a modern uh, uh, large web application today with, in assembly language, well, you probably have a lot of bugs and you probably have a lot of security issues as well uh, uh, to boot. And so the, the step, steps up in abstraction is how we become more productive and so our applications can do more. But not much has really ch uh, changed since the release of Java 26 years ago. Um, that was probably the last big leap in abstraction. Uh, memory managed languages were, were uh, kind of freed us from the tyranny of having to, to, to uh, free up our own memory. Uh, every project I worked on in the games industry in the, in the 90s, which was uh, we wrote our games in C and C++, where you have to manually free up your memory yourself, they all had memory leaks at some point during the development cycle. Um, and, and that's because humans are you know, fallible, right? We, we make mistakes, we forget. Uh, and so memory managed languages were probably the last leap of abstraction that, that happened. Um, but what's kind of interesting, I think, is that when Java came along, it's probably the first language to really do reusable libraries properly, you know, like we have DLLs in C Sharp now. Um, yeah, before that, there wasn't really a kind of a language that had a reusable library system that, that, was, was, that was as good as, as uh, Java's. And so it's arguable that the innovation now, or the abstraction leaps, are coming from libraries and not languages. And that might be why evolution has slowed down or language evolution has slowed down. Yes, there's Rust and Idris and lots of other interesting new languages, but they're not mainstream yet. Um, but even they haven't been as significant a leap of abstraction as assembly to C, for example. So abstraction is how we move forward as an industry. It's how we tame complexity. But why do we need to tame complexity? The computer doesn't care how complex your program is. We need it to help our own brains. The weak and feeble gray matter between our ears isn't evolving quickly enough to deal with the explosion of complexity. And so we need abstraction. So how does OO do abstraction? Interfaces, they hide the implementation, they allow us to swap out the implementation, they allow us to represent a common surface to many implementations. Or data hiding, which is where we have private data inside of a class, it allows us to surface only the things that matter Updating the private state can be made elegant through methods and properties. That all sounds awesome, right? Who wouldn't want these things? Is it true abstraction then? Are things less complex now? It certainly looks on the surface to be abstracting away from the clutter of the implementation below. But when you look closer, you'll see that you've also hidden a dependency graph. You don't know, uh, we now don't know what it's doing. Uh, is it talking to the file system? Is it talking to the database? Does it mutate data internally? Is it thread safe? Does it fundamentally conflict with other components in the system in hidden ways? There's no declaration of intent. And so we have no idea of what the underlying implementation intends to do. But what about com composition? Does composition help in object-oriented programming? We're often told to prefer composition over inheritance probably by one of the prophets of OO, but why? Why do we want composition? We can see the power of composition when the world jumped from assembly languages to procedural languages. We were able to comp compose these three letter mnemonics into procedures and give them names that humans can understand. 
we're able to package up the mechanics of pushing and popping values on and off the stack. And we're able to abstract away from direct mem memory access and let the memory allocator and the languages, references or pointers do the work. That is composition, complete hiding of the complexity layer below. And that's important, complete hiding of the complexity layer below. But we can't, by definition, completely hide the complexity layer uh, below in object-oriented programming, because who knows what the composed interfaces will do, or the hidden mutation within the composed classes. Do they conflict with each other? Are they thread safe? Do they use locks to my deadlock? Now, we can look inside these, uh, these implementations to see what they do, but then we're back to square one. We've lost the benefits of composition. Let me tell you, 99% of the time you hear the word composition, you are being lied to. What people really mean is modularity. In fact, composition is an incredibly difficult property to achieve when it comes to implementing complex systems. But what's the difference? We call a system modular when it's composed of various parts that can be linked together. A typical, a typical example of a modular system is electric wires. Uh, if you open a socket in your wall, you're free, free to connect the wires to the socket in, in many different ways. Too bad the ability to connect things together doesn't allow you to infer anything about the behavior of the system as a whole. To be more precise, modularity guarantees that you can link things with each other, but doesn't prevent the system from exhibiting emergent behavior that in our case would be electric wires exploding in your face. Emergent behavior is what you get when you, in quotes, compose in OO. Emergent behavior is what starts the rot in any code base. This is where the errors come from. The system is truly compositional when it exhibits no emergent behavior. That is, when we are able to predict how a composed system will act just by looking at its components and the way that they are related. Note that that doesn't mean that when linked together, they won't act in a more complicated way. That's usually why we're doing it. You know, when we compose stuff, we want something more complicated, but we don't want emergent behavior or unexpected side effects. So OO composition doesn't exist. It's modularity only. Well, it's a little unfair. It's possible to do true, true composition with OO, but the way it's practiced in industry is not true composition. Right, so I just want to pause for a second um, and take, take a breath. Uh, it sounds like I'm beating up on OO. I'm not, you know, OO has been widely successful over the past 20 or so years. It would be churlish of me to claim otherwise. I do think, however, that OO, as it's practiced today, is running out of steam and running out of luck, uh, primarily due to the complexity problem of our ever expanding code bases and due to its poor handling of composition. That doesn't mean it hasn't any value. There are still aspects of OO that I will use of the functional depending on the use case. Uh, I think if we see OO as a tool in the toolbox rather than the one true way of doing everything, uh, then we can advance to another level. Um, by the way, I can't really see the chat at the moment, so I'm not sure if anybody's asking any questions. Um, let's see if I can get this up. Sorry. All right, I'll crack on. Uh, okay, so, what is functional programming? Um, there isn't really a clear definition of what functional programming is, uh, or even what makes a programming language functional. Uh, the classic definition states that a programming language is functional if it has, has first class functions. Now, first class functions means functions as values. That is, you can pass functions around in variables. We know those as lambdas, func, an action, i.e. delegates. And so by the purest definition of functional programming, C Sharp is a functional programming language. But this feels inadequate as a description of what functional programming is. If you look at how most functional programming languages are implemented, you know, their compilers and their type systems, then they all lean very heavily on lambda calculus which is a formal system of mathematical logic for computation, uh, introduced by Alonzo Church in the 1930s. And it has variants like the simply typed lambda calculus, uh, which again it, it, is what implementations of functional programming languages lean on very heavily. 
also by Alonso Church from um, the 1940s. But what is the definition of lambda calculus? Well, it's here, these three terms here. Um, seems a little bit light in terms of definition, but you know, that's all there is. So lambda calculus has variables. We have variables in C-sharp, check. It has abstractions. Abstractions are lambdas, check. We also have those in C-sharp. And application. So application is the invocation of a lambda with an argument. Um, check, we've also got those in C-sharp. And yeah, that's all there is in lambda calculus, believe it or not. With just those three concepts, you have all you need for a computation of anything. It's a general theory of computation. Now, Alan Turing came along, uh, who was a student of Alonzo Church, by the way, um, and proved that his Turing machine approach to computation, which is also a general theory of computation, was equivalent to, to lambda calculus or isomorphic to. They both proved the same thing, but in different ways. What I think is interesting when you think about the Turing machine, which was a machine with an infinite, or is a machine with an infinite tape, uh, and the tape has instructions on it, with, which are the operations to run. And those instructions could be to go to another part of the tape, which is how you do loops. Um, if you think about it, it's very similar to how computers actually are now at the processor level. The instructions are, uh, on the tape can be seen as a machine, as the machine instructions in a CPU pipeline the raw operations of the machine. Now, if you look at lambda calculus, if we just go back one, you look at these, th these three terms here and how they would be combined together to, to, to compute things. It's very hard to see how that would ever become a physical machine because it's all mathematical expressions, not mechanical instructions that can be run sequentially. And that was the problem for when it was first invented. Church had proved a general theory of computation but we had no idea how to make it into a machine. And that's because it's an abstraction level above the Turing machine. Um, the Turing machine is like assembly language and Lambda calculus is like a high level language. And I think that's really interesting because it kind of hints at a kind of mathematical truth behind the mechanical operation of a, of a computing machine. If we explore that some more, then we might consider that expressions are fundamental. They're high level abstractions over sequential operations. And that is a key aspect, I believe, of what makes functional programming so powerful. We try to leverage the power of mathematical expressions so that we can take a step back from the complexity of sequential operations. I mean, mathematics is thousands of years old. We, we shouldn't ignore that. If you're not sure what I mean by sequential operations, I mean imperative programming, as seen as, uh, in object-oriented and procedural languages. To take that step up in abstraction, we need to start thinking and working with expressions almost entirely. And not just expressions, but pure expressions. So pure expressions, they always evaluate to a value. When you run them, they turn into a value, right? And you can replace the expression with the value that it, uh, you know, it, it equates to, uh, and it would do the same job. You, know, you can't have a void expression, and the expression shouldn't have any side effects, like launching a nuclear missile, for example. It should be entirely contained within, within its own uh, um, world, as it were. Um, when pure expressions are wrapped up into functions, then you get pure functions. Now I've got exactly one bullet point here for pure functions. And that is because this is all that matters. Pure functions are composable. And they compose in the true meaning of the word compose. They're, it's, they're not just modular, they are composable. If you write pure expressions and you wrap them in, up into pure functions, when you compose uh, pure functions and only pure functions, then you get more advanced behavior, which is also pure. And then you get that more advanced behavior, which is pure, combine it with more advanced behavior, which is also pure, and you get even more advanced behavior, which is also pure. You know, it's pure all the way down, turtles all the way down. If you remember when, when I talked about the emergent behavior of object-oriented modularity, there is no emergent uh, behavior here. 
there is only more advanced and expected functionality with no unexpected side effects. This is the abstraction leap we are looking for. Okay, so it's time to start looking at some examples. So there's a number of things going on in this, uh, uh, in, in this uh, slide, so let's pick it apart. Um, first of all, we're using C-sharp records at the top. So if you've not seen those, they're immutable um, record types or immutable classes effectively um, that have equality and all that kind of stuff built in. Um, and I'll talk about immutability shortly. It's important, immutability is important, and I'll talk about that, that shortly, but uh, just, just assume for now that immutability matters. Now, if you look at this function here, um, example, we can see a seek of person. Now, this is the uh, language X main list type, which is also immutable. Uh, it can be lazy, like uh, I enumerable. Uh, however, it will only ever evaluate once, uh, unlike I enumerable. And so we have a list of person records here. Uh, we then call this function find oldest, which is here. Um, and this may be where it gets a little bit confusing. Um, what is fold? Well, if you've ever used aggregate uh, in link, then you know what the, this is. It's in the functional programming world, building an aggregate value over a sequence of items is called a fold. Uh, and we say that we're folding the list or we say the sequence is foldable. Um, it is one of the fundamental operations of functional programming and, we, and you'll see it used a lot. It avoids the need for recursion because in functional programming, we don't have loops, right? We, we use recursion for loops and obviously recursion in C sharp blows the stack and so we use fold and, and fold is often how it's used in even with languages that do have recursion too. Um, and the reason we don't use loops uh, is because loops are statements, they're not expressions. And so when you recursively call yourself, you're still part of the same, uh, same expression, uh, but that all the, it can all be captured within, uh, or at least for aggregation to be caught in, in, in a fold. And so this starts with uh, an in initial value of zero. And then for each person in this, um, in this uh, sequence, uh, this delegate gets called. Uh, and the initial value at, at zero will be passed through as age here. And then we compare it with the person's age. And if the person's age is greater, then we take that as the latest value. Otherwise, we return age, age back here. Note how we're using a ternary here. Ternaries are expressions, they're if statement expressions, basically. Um, and so we've, what we've done here is we've, we've made everything into an expression. Uh, we've, we've evaded the use of for each uh, by using fold, and we've evaded the use of, of an if statement by using a ternary. Now, if we compare that to the imperative version um, and, and the functional version side by side, um, I'll just give you a second to have a quick look at that. In the functional version, we don't need to write the boilerplate of the loop, right? There's no loop here. We don't have to manage the, uh, the assignment or the maintenance or the declaration of the state or the returning of the state. In the functional version, we have everything as an expression. And so there's, you know, when, when, uh, when the age isn't greater, then we just return the current, current age. If we left that off, then this wouldn't compile. What about here? The, the, the else expression here, uh, sorry, the, the, the lack of the else here, um, is that right? You know, there's no else statement. Should it be there? In this case, it's correct and it works, but the real, that's a real problem for not working with expressions. There are branches of code that could be missing entirely and the compiler won't give us any help on that, leading to subtle bugs. Whereas if we don't have the else part of the ternary here, it just doesn't compile. The functional version is what we call declarative. It declares its intent. It doesn't specify how to do the operation. It just declares what it wants. In the imperative version, we have to specify all of our intents, how to loop, how to initialize the state, how to aggregate the state. 
In the functional version, we don't specify any of that. We only specify the core of the aggregation process, the essence, not the mechanics of running the, uh, the aggregation uh, operation itself. And so often when you hear people talk about functional programming, they'll talk about uh, declarative programming. It's they kind of use hand in hand together. Now then, this is interesting. In the imperative version, we have seven slots in the original code where we can do something crazy. In the functional version, we've got zero. There's nowhere in the functional expression to insert some bad behavior. Anyone who's worked on a large code base over time knows that going back to old code and modifying it for whatever pressing business reasons happens frequently. It's often difficult for the person coming back to that code to understand all of the original business reasons for creating it in the first place. And so they may find what they believe is a suitable, suitable place in the code and try to inject the new behavior there. But this can rapidly escalate the complexity level, especially if that code causes side effects. So that's seven opportunities for errors and complexity in one tiny function. Imagine how bad this is for, a complex, uh, for more complex functions or a whole application. And so expressions can work like constraints, like mini containers for functionality that shouldn't be broken apart. They're units of computation, they're values. But hold on, is there another issue here? What happens when the list is empty? We get zero return, right? The problem with this function is what the consumer of your function sees from the outside. We don't want the we don't want uh, programmers using our code to have to go in and read our code to use it, right? We want it to be declarative. We want it to talk to us, and we could actually, you know, when you look at this, you think, well, okay, you get zero back. Did that mean that there was somebody who was zero years old, or was there nobody in the list? Maybe we could return minus one because nobody has ever been minus one years old. But the signature of the method doesn't help tell us what that means or if we're even going to get it. We'd have to look at the documentation or go and look inside the function, breaking the ideals of, comp of composition. And this is definitely a problem. The whole purpose of types is to represent a set of possible values that are acceptable. The value of types for programmers, other than the comp compiler doing checks for us, is that they're declarative. We can read the type signatures and make inferences from that. But not here, we have int. I mean, is it even an age? It could be the ID of the person from the database or something like that. So let's refactor. So what I've done now is I've added a language X record type called age, age here that just takes and has an integer value for the age. Now you could use C sharp records here like we did before. But the benefit of language X records is that they also have ordering. They're comparable by default. Um, we've updated the person record here to take the age. Um, and if we come down to the find oldest function, you can see we've now got slightly more complex function with a different return type. And we're returning an, an age now, so we know it's not an ID, uh, but it's an option age. Uh, an option is, a, uh, is the optional type from language X. It, it says that you may or may not get the value that you want. Um, you can think of it as something like a nullable value, um, but you can't physically get to the, to the value within without pattern matching on the option. And so it forces you to deal with the fact that you may have an optional result. Now, if we look inside, we can see that the fold now takes uh, none as its initial state. And so if we've got an empty list, then none will be returned back. Um, if we go into the folds delegate, we can see with pattern matching on the optional age. And if it's none, we take the initial, uh, well, the first person that comes along. And if it's some, we unpack the, the age from, from the option uh, and then compare them uh, and, and return the aggregate, uh, well, the, the, the maximum as we, as we did before. Now, from the outside, that's more declarative, right? If you were just hovering over this function uh, in the code and not looking inside, you would be able to see find oldest takes a sequence of person and returns 
maybe an age, right? An optional age that talks to the programmer. That's much more declarative. You don't have to go and look inside. And this is what we're looking for. Uh, it's also all pure, right? And so we can rely on this to always work well with and only work with the, the input values given to the, uh, given to the function. But the internals of this are starting to look a little bit cluttered, right? It looks a little bit messy. Um, and working with expressions often means quite terse and compressed code. And so it's very good practice to break them into small components. When I mentioned earlier about the dogma in our industry, uh, one piece of dogma is that small functions are bad. This isn't true. And it's actively encouraged in functional programming. So let's break it up. Okay, so we've now broken it up into three. Now that might seem a little bit excessive, but the, the units of functionality are what matter here. First, we've got this find oldest person here that takes two person uh, uh, records, person A and person B, and it captures um, or extracts the, the finding of the maximum that we, was the core of the, um, the fold operation before. Suddenly we've extracted something that could be used in other scenarios, not just lists of person. This is a useful function in its own right. Second, we've got a new function that looks a little bit like the old one, but instead of returning option age, it returns option person. And we shouldn't be, we, the, the idea is that we shouldn't just be limited to re returning the age, we, should, we could get the oldest person as well, right? Um, interestingly, this uses fold again, but on the option. So option itself has uh, support for fold. And as I was saying earlier, you, you will see fold on many types, not just lists. Uh, although you could think of an option as a list that can only have either zero or one value uh, uh, in it. Um, so it's either a singleton list or an empty list. Um, and so you can see how fold kind of makes sense sequentially as well, or for sequences as well. But what I find interesting or most interesting here is now basically our, our original function, find old, oldest, uh, renamed to find old, oldest age here. Uh, it returns an option age as before, but now we, we just call find oldest person. Uh, this may return none if the sequence is empty. Uh, we call map on that, uh, which maps the person to the, uh, to the person's age and you get an optional age back. Now, if this returns none, this doesn't run. But we didn't have to write an if statement there saying if is if if uh, age is null or something like that. We didn't have to do any of those checks. We just had to map it. The option deals with that automatically for you. Um, and so you can't accidentally run some code against uh, 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 an unset uh, piece of data. Um, map is also um, one of the most fundamental functions you're going to see. When uh, in your journey of, uh, as a functional programmer, um, types that support map are known as functors, and you'll see it, see them everywhere. Uh, so fold and map are the two key key functions you've seen so far. You may recognise map because it's select in link. Um, Microsoft chose their own names for for uh, for for link, which is a little bit frustrating. Um, select is, is map, uh, where is filter, um, select many is bind. Um, but, you know, we prefer to use the, the functional names because that's the, that's the kind of syntax or grammar or lexicon really of, of, of the functional programmer. Um, but hold on, can we do even better here? Is that nested fold really? the best we can do. It's still looking a little bit ugly, right? I mean, if you think about it, the, the only time that we need an optional value here is when the list is empty. And so why do we even need to come in here if, if the list is empty? So we can rewrite it again. And this suddenly becomes much more elegant. And we, so instead of kind of jumping into a fold, and managing the maybe non-state all the way through, 
we just check up front in a ternary. Again, it's an expression to see if it's empty. If it's empty, we return none. Otherwise, we call reduce. Now, reduce is another type of fold. It's a fold function that has no initial state. It takes its initial state from the first item in the sequence. Um, and so it can't work on empty sequences. So we've got to check, check for that, right? So now let's get the imperative version and our functional version side by side. So if we compare the two, we can see we've now got three small functions that are very declarative. Each one is valuable in its own right, right? You can see the value to each one of those functions. Um, they're all composed of pure functions or pure expressions, uh, making all of these functions pure. And that's what we're looking for, code that talks to us. These type signatures talk to us, the, the expressions talk to us. They're very, very concise. We're declaring our intent. We're not dealing with the mechanics of loops and, and state management ourselves. We're letting the, the, current, the, the abstraction do the work. So let's have a quick review of what we're seeing. Um, and if there's any uh, questions, this is a good pause point. Um, yeah, some, some modulus, yeah. <laughs> um, so let's have a quick uh, review. Uh, so we've seen pure functions. We want to use pure functions everywhere. Uh, and we want to use them because they compose, right? We, there's, there's no emergent behavior, just expected behavior. So you get much more complica complicated programs that don't rot, you know? It gives us superpowers as programmers. The code stays written. Right, they don't just slowly fall apart over time, uh, which which is definitely something I've seen on uh, other types of code base, shall we say? Um, we've seen that the uh, the the language X immutable list, list type called seek, which is a, a better version of I enumerable, um, and we've seen the la language X option type for representing optional values declaratively. It's a better nullable or nullable reference. Uh, we've seen fold, which is one of the core functions in functional programming for loops that aggregate. And we've seen map, which is also one of the core functions in functional programming for loops that map values, but maintain the structure of what's being mapped. So it doesn't collapse the value. So for example, if you're doing a map over a sequence, you end up with a sequence that's the same length, just with all the values inside mapped but it's still a sequence and it's still the same length it's still got the same structure same if you did it on an option you would still get if you call map on it you get an option out of it but the value within is is, is has been uh, projected um, and we know that as as uh, as select from link uh, and we know fold as as aggregate from from link yeah but i, I just want one more question it's regarding the record. Uh, sorry, you explained it, but I, I don't get it uh, with the, the difference between the one from LanguageX, so the uh, attributes decorator, and the one from, uh, from C Sharp itself. Yeah, sure. Um, so the LanguageX records existed before C Sharp records, right? And the idea was to bring the power of what you get with C Sharp's records now into C Sharp before they had them, right? Um, and so there's actually two types of records in language X, there's the original record types, um, which you you used to, uh, well, you, you could declare any type from record, uh, record you know, uh, A. So if you, had a, if you had a record called person and you derived it from record you know, uh, generic person, then it would use IL and build all of the comparison operators and all that stuff for you automatically without any kind of manual inclusion of a code gen library or source generators or anything like that. Um, but that has a little bit of a hit in terms of performance when you first use it, because it has to compile it in memory at the time. Uh, and so there's a, uh, there's a DLL or library um, uh, with LanguageX called languagex.codegen, uh, which uses the, uh, what the kind of the, uh, what was the source generators of uh, Roslyn before source generators existed? It was written by one of the one of the team of uh, Roslyn team, um, and that's what's used to to uh, 
look for these attributes in your code uh, and then generate some code. And so for the for the record types, um, it generates all of the equality operators or you know, and all of the constructors and all of that kind of stuff automatically. Uh, it does it with there's an equivalent for union types as well. Um, and it has a few extra extra powerful components to it that uh, C sharp records don't have. It has lenses, which is probably a bit outside of this discussion. Um, and it has uh, um, ordering, as I say, comparable operators. Um, so you can you can use it in a um, you know a a set a, a, a sortable set, right? Uh, I hope that helps. Um, I mean, personally, I tend to use the C sharp records now. You know, so I consider them to a certain extent legacy. I'll keep supporting them, obviously. Um, but you know, if you do want that little bit of extra power that they they give you, then they'll they'll, they'll still be there. Okay, so um, I mentioned earlier that immutability was important, uh, and it's worth digging into why. It's partly philosophical, um, but it also talks to our desires for co truly compositional functions, um, which leads to more robust code. Now, if we look at this example, uh, on the surface, it looks similar to what we've been doing before. We have expressions, we're using fold, uh, and it's kind of declarative, but we have a problem. Number, the type, is mutable. You know, this, this value here is mutable. It has some state inside that can be changed in place. Now, this is a simple example, obviously. Uh, it could be any hidden state. You know, if you've got a member function that mutates the, the, uh, the object in one form or another, this is meant to represent that. So you may be thinking, oh, nobody would ever make a, a field public like that. Just imagine this is a more complex type that's got other stuff going on behind the scenes. Um, now, if we expand this out, uh, I mean, in, in this use case, it probably doesn't seem that bad. Uh, but, you know, you, you keep writing your program, you add extra stuff to your program, and suddenly you end up in, with some, something, something like this. We have a new function here. This function goes through a sequence of numbers and adds one to every every uh, every item in the uh, in the list of numbers. It's returning void, by the way, which we don't like. Um, and then there's this function here, which uh, runs two operations in parallel uh, on the same set of numbers. Now suddenly, sum will give us unpredictable results. It's undefined what we will get as, as, as a result because we have a race condition. These two things are fundamentally conflicting with each other. That's because the number is mutable. Uh, we can't have shared data between uh, on, on multiple threads uh, without the possibility of race conditions. Now we can use locks and those types of, or you know, any kind of semaphore mechanism to try and coordinate but it's much better to, to not have the data in changeable or mutable, or mutable in the first place. What's interesting is that when sum was written, you know, before add one was written and in parallel was written, um, this all would have worked perfectly fine. And then later on, somebody comes along and writes add one and does a load of parallel processing and sum breaks. And so, I know this is a contrived example, but having to consider all future yet to be written code seems crazy to me. If number was immutable, then some would always work. And, and that's the way to think about it, is you, you wanna write code that's, that's robust today, thinking that maybe something in the future could come along and break that, that robustness. You want it to be robust now. Oh, sorry. Um, now you may think that this is only a small problem uh, for the cases of parallel processing, right? You might, it's only a problem for multi-threaded multi code, right? Um, we just need to protect the things that are being used in this multi-threaded uh, arena, but that's wrong. This function adds two numbers together, um, but it also calls foo with left-hand side and right-hand side. Uh, maybe this is just logging. Who knows? It's certainly not declarative. Uh, but maybe foo modifies number. 
and perhaps it does it in a non-deterministic way. Either way, we can't know without looking inside the foo function what, what it's doing. And so that breaks this abstraction idea or the, you know, the kind of compositional idea that we don't need to look inside the box to know what's going on. And so it means that every time we call add number with the same values, we get a different result. And although this, again, it's a contrived example, this is how imperative code works today. This is how most, of, most code works. Um, if you're already using immutability to protect yourself against these types of issues, I mean, congratulations, this, this is how it should be done. This isn't unique to functional programming. You should be doing this anyway. Uh, but you should do it for all types, not just a subset. Now, I think it's, it's kind of interesting if you think about what immutability is and the transformation of immutable values. Um, is Immutability is time. When you transform an immutable value, like a person in this example, uh, you've created a new present from the past. At this point, we have the past and the present. Um, and the call of this function knows that we're not uh, corrupting the values passed in because they're immutable. Uh, but it's also become de declarative because we're returning a person. Um, should be obvious to the call of this function what they're getting back, i.e. a new person. Uh, but within, uh, you know, in programming, we are always working with the past. You get some data from a database. By the time it arrives, it's data from the past. Even a value assigned to a variable is working with the past. We don't get to break the speed of light. And so we need to think about what, what immutability is. Um, mutation has no concept of time. It simply updates one copy of the value in place, rewriting history, rewriting the present and writing the future. It is complicated for us, us humans to deal with uh, a web of data that mutates in place. It's a level of complexity that we can't really handle for all but the most trivial of, uh, trivial of applications. Um, and we have no easy way of representing that in our minds. If you think about how we think of, of things that happened in the past, it's like snapshots, points in time, discrete events. We don't get to update or overwrite, overwrite our history. History exists. With immutability, we have a chance to understand causality and work with a snapshot of a point in time. One that's sound, one that's consistent and unchanging. And it doesn't suffer from race conditions or rogue code that might change the state behind our backs. Immutable values like the number five, don't, you don't expect the number five to magically change to the number four, right? That's how we should think about all data, as though it's like the number five, you know, person here. Once you've got a person record with a name, a surname, whatever, you, you can't change it. The only thing you can do is create a new person with, with an updated name, and the old person is, is the person from the past. This point here on, on the on the where the comment is that says at this point we have the past person and the present uh, new person, we have the ability to do undo. We have the ability to know where we came from and we have the ability to to kind of uh, do multi-threaded code for free. Nobody has to worry about this record, you know, traveling around the system uh, on multiple threads because nobody can 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 update it. The 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 issues are the issues of, of um, um, kind of resolution of you know, multiple threads, say maybe updating a value. That's, that's a bit outside of this talk, but it's, it is actually a problem that happens now with mutable code. It's just that you're not dealing with it, right? You're, you're just allowing this kind of, uh, well, some semaphore like mechanism to just have, have a, a, a free reign on, on a mutable value, but you've got no concept of causality or you know, whether the, the, the value being updated is being updated based on, on you know, what the value is now, uh, or has something else changed it in the meantime? Uh, there's, there's techniques around that, like vector clocks and so on, which, which can help you there. But the reality is that uh, this isn't handled very well uh, by mutability. Immutability gives us a fighting chance.
Um, and it fac facilitates composition, right? That's the key. Yeah. As soon as we're using immutable values pass through pure functions, then every single time you call a pure function with the same immutable values, you will get the same result out. You get deterministic code, no emergent behavior. And so what have we learned? You might be wondering why I didn't really show that much of language, language X. And that's because you don't really need language X to write functional code in C sharp. And I'm not gonna sit here and just say, that's the only library that you should use. There's plenty of other functional programming li uh, uh, libraries that, that you could use, but actually you don't need any of them to get started. You know, link and so on is a reasonably good place to start. Um, but the reason that I wrote it in the first place um, is to make functional programming easier uh, in C sharp and to make it the default option rather than uh, kind of defaulting to say the dictionary types which are mutable or list types which are mutable. Yeah, I wanted to make it easier to get to do the right thing, to, to pick the right types, to use immutability, to, uh, to use pattern matching and expressions and pure expressions. So that's why it exists. But you know, teaching that in this in this uh, session isn't going to help you, right? What you what you need to, to to understand is why we're doing this, and it's to take that abstraction leap up. True composition, immutability for modeling time and causality, and pure functions as a building blocks of everything. Those things are just staples of this, and you don't need language X to do that. Um, I think also, you know, there's there's plenty of stuff to, to learn before you, you know, you can go on to the next level as well, which is, um, I mean, you're probably thinking, well, if you've got pure functions that don't have side effects, how do we actually write code that does anything? Um, and there's a lot of stuff in the language X wiki that, that can help you on that. That's beyond your kind of your, your initial uh, uh, experiments with, with language X, I would say. Um, and finally, I'd like to, uh, to encourage you to spend some time with a purely functional programming language like Haskell or PureScript. It will truly open your eyes. You won't, it won't allow you to cheat by writing in pure code. Um, and was certainly what got me started uh, um, with, uh, uh, with composition and so on. Uh, you could, of course, try F Sharp, which uh, as an ecosystem, it doesn't really push purity. Um, I think it's, I think F sharp is probably focusing more on the Python programmer, uh, trying to bring them into the .NET ecosystem than say the programmer who wants to write more robust programs through kind of higher level types or something like that. Uh, and although it has a nice syntax, I don't believe it's pushing the abstraction story forwards right now. So I think learning Haskell um, is a better route to kind of getting to the fundamentals of, of, of functional program programming. Uh, but it still has value, you know, if you're spending time with F-sharp, you, you know, you're still going to learn a lot. Um, you may be wondering why I didn't mention the word monad once in this talk, uh, and here it is, consider it mentioned. Uh, but seriously, monads are very important, in my opinion, um, and they allow you to take, yes, another abstraction leap up. You know, all of what I've talked about today is about the abstraction and the composition uh, of pure functions and so on. That will get you so much further than, than you, you could ever imagine. Now, pure uh, uh, monads, which you know, we've used two today, seek and option are both monads. They will allow you to take another leap above, right? Um, and really kind of uh, abstract even further away from, from where, where we are now in, in terms of these kind of sequential operations. Um, but it is just a bit too far out of this discussion to, to kind of go through it today. Um, but I do think that they are probably one of the most powerful concepts of functional programming. S some, some fields or some uh, ecosystems uh, really kind of go against the whole monad idea. Uh, F-sharp is actually kind of, you know, one of those areas where they, they try to pretend monads don't exist. They even call it something else like railway oriented programming to uh, I think I think they think we're idiots or something um, but 
um, something like Haskell, it's it's all monads, right? You know, the whole ecosystem is, is, is monads, but you won't necessarily see them in OCaml or something like that, right? So it's, it's different, it depends where you are. I personally believe, and this is opinion, by the way, this is just opinion. I personally believe that they are one of the most powerful concepts in, in programming full stop and allows us to take a, an even more powerful abs, uh, a leap of abstraction away from uh, you know, the, the, the way that we do software engineering today. So anyway, it was a pleasure to come and talk to you uh, today um, and share my ideas on software engineering and functional programming. I hope this more philosophical talk has given you some insight into the why and will encourage you, you know, to take the first steps into functional programming world. So thank you. Uh, I'll look at some of these questions now. Um, well, thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Paul. It was great. Yeah. Cool. Great That's thinking cool. about, about code. It's always refreshing to have this kind of, uh, of thinking about what we do about, uh, about these kind of questions. Yeah, it was really great. Yeah. I think I think that's it, right? You know, because as I said at the start, um, writing functional code is a different mindset, and you kind of need to switch into that mindset. It takes a while to settle in, and you'll kind of make the classic mistakes, which you know always happens, um, and have quite you know th things like the when when I talked about the expressions getting quite large and and ugly and, and breaking them into the small functions, it's very easy to fall into the traps of making those those mistakes. And it feeling a lot more awkward because you're artificially adding some constraints to writing code, right? We 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 have to force ourselves to do the right things here. C sharp will let us do lots of naughty stuff, which will turn into errors later on. And so we 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 have to kind of be quite strict with ourselves to do this. Uh, and it may feel a little bit kind of awkward when you first use it and difficult and I mean maybe even pointless, right? But eventually you, you kind of get a feeling for it, your mindset changes and the, the composition of purity kind of grows and everything starts to, to feel a lot more stable. Um, I know that when I first started uh, 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 with functional after using OO for probably about a decade or so, um, I felt like I was writing code that I understood even though I'd been writing code for 20, 25 years or something at that point already, I started feeling like I finally got it. I finally understood it, right? And, and that feeling of knowing why this thing works or, is, or kind of having an understanding of the bigger picture was really powerful. Um, okay, so let's uh, just try and cover some of these uh, things here. So, how to deal with the learning curve of a functional approach, different paradigm, IO, monad, lenses, composable, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think that, as I said, just start with the basics of pure functions, composition. Um, there's, there's some schools of thought that if, uh, if, if, it, if your code isn't all completely pure, then what's the point? I think writing sub, sub, um, subsystems of your code or, bits of you know, your, your system in a functional way, keeping it nice and pure, and you know, just kind of understanding that and then building out is quite a good way. Um, the problem obviously with, 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 fun with code that has no side effects is how do you do stuff like um, open a file or you know, write to the database. Now there's complex, um, ideas like uh, IO monads and that kind of stuff. Uh, and in LanguageX, they're called the, uh, the effect system, which is uh, F and AF uh, and pipes. Now that's quite a complex topic, but a, 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 an easy way of thinking about it is you want your IO at the edges and your pure stuff in the middle, right? And so you, you can then test, test your pure stuff and test all of your logic and worry about the integration tests at the end. Um, over time, you're going to want to kind of turn that into something a little bit more declarative, uh, but that's an easier way to start. Um, I would definitely look into uh, some books on this as well. Obviously, I did a, I was a technical proof from the uh, functional programming in C sharp book, which I think is a pretty good uh, introduction. Um, but you know, the thing that really made it work for me uh, was learning Haskell, right? And Haskell is a really interesting language because. Uh, especially back then when there was no real kind of um, 
uh, like language service support. So you didn't really get any useful um, red squiggles when you were typing. It felt like the compiler hated me all the time, right? I, it was just constantly whinging about type, this type is wrong, that is type is wrong. And I, I slowly kind of got into it and it, it made me think differently about code. Um, it's, it's one of the most powerful things I think for, for learning this stuff. Um, not pure, but Kotlin for Java programmers sure has some great features. I've not used uh, Kotlin, but uh, I'm sure that's true. Um, I don't think naming Mona as something else is bad as long as it has. Well, so yeah, as not naming monads monads and calling it something else is okay to a certain degree, but calling it something, I, my, my sense is that uh, the kind of F sharp, um, well, gurus, for want, want of a better word, are trying to, um, well, they don't trust people to, to learn some of the complex stuff, right? Uh, calling everything something oriented programming is trying to pander to the C-sharp engineer and trying to, like pretending we're stupid, right? Um, learning monads, yeah, I, it seems to be like a really complex thing for, for people to get their heads around. And maybe it's the word, maybe it is the word, I don't know. If they were called um, something like chainable, these things are chainable, so you can chain operations together, maybe that would be enough, right? To, to make it a bit more obvious what they are, a bit like functors, if they were called mappable, then maybe that, that would uh, make more sense, um, uh, especially because of the way that we use um, uh, kind of type names in, uh, in, in, in the OO world. Um, but sure, I, I, I don't have a big issue with it. I just think that uh, to a certain extent, when you don't know the lexicon that everybody else uses for this stuff, then it holds you back to a certain degree. Um, so is language X intended to take, a, uh, take more of a pure functional approach than F-sharp? Uh, yes, to a degree. I mean, so F-sharp obviously is a language, not a library ecosystem, right? So it's not the same thing. I'm not trying to write a language here. Um, but I would say that the the in, in F sharp you've got computation expressions, right? That's their version of monads, and they're not they are leveraged. You know, people do use them in libraries, um, but I don't see them pushed forwards as much as uh, other um, uh, other kind of functional techniques. So they're much more they're much more likely to prefer passing a context manually through. Uh, through a pipeline or something like that, rather than uh, using a, a computation expression. Um, but you know, it's different communities work in different ways. I've I've got a very clear idea of why I want uh, language X to be all about purity, and it's because I'm writing it for my own company to write more robust software. Right, that's the reason I wrote this is for me and my my employees to write much more reliable software. Um, and it just so happens other people like it, right? Um, so I don't have an issue or some, or I, you know, I'm not trying to compete with any other space. I'm just trying to create something that I believe is right. Um, do you advocate event sourcing for immutability at the database persistence layer? <clears throat> um, I've not been a, uh, I've not heavily used event sourcing myself, so I wouldn't advocate uh, or be an advocate for anything around event sourcing, not that it, I shouldn't be. I'm just not, uh, I just haven't used that much event sourcing. So um, I, I, I wouldn't want to say that. But what I would say is that um, anything that, that is a functional stream of values uh, that can be composed, right? You know, a bit like with observables and so on, um, having a concept of, uh, of a permanent uh, view of your history you know, so you can go to any snapshot in the past and make decisions about what happened then uh, and it not m mutate in place makes sense. And so event, event sourcing kind of fit, fits into that into that uh, idea. There's other um, um, databases like um, Closure's Datomic, which takes a very pure uh, um, approach to um, 
uh, maintaining the history of everything, right? Um, I look at scholars as, as, as Zio, uh, when they're going for more practicality and enterprise adoption, providing more friendly names. Uh, so the question is, uh, how does functional programming correspond to the function, uh, performance aspect? Um, obviously, I mean, Zio or, or what's what's in Zio uh, is in language X as well. Um, so they've called their their IO mon monads Zio, EO, lots of ver versions of, of IO, right? Just something with uh, IO prefixed with something else. Um, I don't necessarily think they've they've given it the more kind of enterprisey names. They're, they're, it's still mostly kind of functional names for stuff. Um, I've called them a, a F and AF for asynchronous and synchronous effects, because um, I think that sounds a bit more general. And also you've got F and AF monads in Haskell and in uh, PureScript. So uh, there's some familiarity there. Um, uh, in terms of performance, performance can be a problem, of course, especially when you're using link. Uh, I, the way I, I look at this, uh, and yeah, I, I used to write high-performance 3D graphics engines, right? I, I wrote code right to the, to the metal. And if there's one thing that I've realized now is doing that stuff is almost nearly, well, nearly almost a waste of time uh, for, for modern applications. However, there may be bits of your application that need special attention, right? A, a particularly fast loop or something like that. Um, I guess some of you guys are maybe uh, uh, working with in the banking sector, so kind of trading uh, performance, that kind of stuff matters, right? And also the memory allocation costs uh, of allocating lots of small, small uh, objects and freeing them up. Um, that's not free, you know? But I think it's, it's much more important to write code that is correct first, and then optimize later. The value of writing pure functions uh, and pure expressions is that because each one is essentially a part of a tree of, you know, a tree of, uh, of an expression, you can get any bit of that tree and pull it out and replace it with something highly optimized, right? The implementation of fold, for example, in language X is a for loop, right? It's imperative. But on the outside, it's pure. So on the inside, I've had to highly optimize that to be quick for C sharp. But on the outside, it looks like uh, you know a, a pure function. Um, and so the beauty is that you don't have this tangled web of stuff that you need to try and pull apart when you want to go and optimize. You just find the node in the tree of the expression, which is problematic. You rip that node out and then you replace it with something that is fast. And all you've got to care about is what was below that node in the, in, in, in the expression. And that's it. And so, it, so performance optimization becomes a lot easier. Um, but you should always start with the, with the correct, uh, correctness approach first, I believe. Um, OK, so um, and actually, I just want to kind of go back slightly to this, uh, the naming stuff as well. Um, I've I've come across this quite a lot. You know, some people have have, have, have kind of balked at my use of certain naming uh, uh, um, terms like fold um, and bind instead of select many or map instead of select. Um, I think this, to a certain extent, we're, we're conditioned, especially in the .NET sphere, that if it's not if it's not by Microsoft, it's not the one true way, right? And they're not right about everything. Microsoft are not right about everything. Now, I understand that this might not sit well with every organization and it may not be enterprise friendly in the sense that maybe this just doesn't get picked up or used uh, within those, those environments. And do, do you know what, I'm, I'm okay with that, right? I'm not trying to solve all world, world's Ill, ills with this. I'm trying to make something that is trying to try, trying to create a new community within C Sharp, which is about doing functional programming. The way I think of it is that C Sharp is going to become very much like Scala uh, over the next 10 years. Yeah, I, I don't know if we're ever going to see higher kind of types, but I reckon we will. Um, and once we've got discriminated unions, then we're pretty much there, right? And so if you look at the Scala community, there's the object-oriented Scala community, and then there's the 
very heavily uh, functional programming uh, community of Zio and Cats, Cats Effects, right? And those communities are kind of into. And, and so I think there is a place to be opinionated about this. And I think it is right to follow what people expect of functional programming names. Um, yes, the, what Florian said there, purity, immutability, accepting constraints to get certainty, easier to unit test to. Absolutely. I mean, it's so much easier to write a unit test. Um, one thing that's gone into LanguageX recently is the uh, the AF and the F monads, which have injectable runtimes, which allows you to inject uh, your side effects, uh, but also inject your unit testable side effects. And I've built, you know, kind of in memory versions of the file system and so on. Um, and it's been it become much easier for us to do uh, kind of uh, unit testing of things that, that talk to the file system, talk to a database, talk to whatever um, than, than, than before. Um, not that you should use it to test the file system, but you should use it to test things that would talk to a file system, if you see what I mean. So test the logic of that. <laughs> a monad is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors. What is the problem? Uh, yeah, quite. That's part of the problem um, in the sense that um, there is a certain grammar or lexicon to, to functional programming, which is outside of the object-oriented friendly space of terms. But if you think about it, when you first heard polymorphism, what did that do to you, right? I mean, that's quite a complex term if you first, uh, if you're hearing it uh, in relation to programming for the first time. There's just a dialect which belongs to, to the functional world, which is its own uh, uh, own thing. And it takes a little bit of time to learn it, right? That's, that's just the way it is. I know some of these words are a little bit awkward, um, but you know, that it just takes a bit of time to, to get your head around it, unfortunately. Uh, by the way, category theory, you don't need to know category theory to know how to write code in, in, in uh, 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 write functional code. I do actually think category theory is a lot easier to learn than a lot of people uh, realize. And I'd, I'd, I'd recommend going and looking at the Bartosz Malewski's uh, videos on YouTube. Uh, he, he also talks about the, you know, the kind of essence of programming somewhat as well, and so, some of what I've talked about today. Um, but it's yeah, at least the stuff that matters for programmers, the, bit, the bits of category theory that matters for programmers, it's actually not that hard. Uh, and it might give you a little bit more of an insight, but you know, you don't need it. You don't need it to, to, to know what, what uh, functional programming is. Um, so if you're not using uh, event sourcing yourself, presumably you're using mutable state at the persistence layer. How do you reconcile immutability within the code versus mutability within the database. Uh, does that mutability undermine immutability in the code? Mutability of, a, of uh, in place mutability of the database absolutely undermines pretty much everything you do, right? Um, and so the way that we try to deal with that um, is through, uh, well, we use a combination of functional programming uh, and um, uh, the actor model. And so uh, there's another library that I've got uh, called uh, Echo Process. Uh, it's a little bit broken at the moment, so don't, don't go and get it. <laughs> but uh, Echo Process is uh, an actor model, and the actor model uh, uh, has the concept of taking a state and a message and returning a state. And then that state comes back through for the next call, uh, for the next message, and then you return. It's a fold, right? So actors are, are are a, a fold over a stream of messages. And so we approach it from that point of view. Uh, when we have something that we need to mutate, then we put it into an actor's state, and then we fold over the actor, or fold, fold over the stream. Uh, and, and so this is just one big long fold operation. Um, but you know, the actor model can be seen as object-oriented to a certain extent. And you could argue that object that the actor model is actually object oriented done right, um, and so we probably do use a combination of you know, real object oriented and uh, functional programming. But the way that I uh, I um, wrote Echo was to make this this concept of the fold over the messages uh, very explicit, um, so that we would um, be able to write these functional expressions um, for for the actors. Um, I tend to picture functional programming as a pipe structure when something gets in. 
uh, follows the path comes out as a result yeah it's not a bad bad thing i think it's um like a, another another way of thinking about it is is if you've got a state which is the world you know everything in the world in a single state right and then things that happen in the world events right coming in as a stream and then when you process the event with the current state of the world and you return the new state of the world you fold over the stream right and that's that's not a bad way of thinking about a program right that's how it how it kind of works it's not that easy to really do that when you when you want to do that in code um but the way that we do that with actors is kind of mini versions of that so each actor is like a mini world of its own that only has its own state and then kind of just folds over its own state from a stream um but you could imagine a whole program being being that uh, and nearly everything in computing is about projection of one value into an output value, right? Request, response, you know, function calls, those types of things. But, uh, and then a lot of it is, is kind of processing lists of one form or another. It's either a list that is, an, you know, a, a kind of concrete list that you've got now, or a stream, which is, you know, essentially a lazy list, right? Um, so it sounds like the handlers that generate aggregates, projections, and event sourcing. Event sourcing is indeed simply a left fold over events of previous state. But there you go. Fair enough. Um, cool. Okay. So uh, any other questions? Oh, sorry. There's there are some others there. Uh, did you did you already think about contributing to directly to the C sharp language design? Uh, I have contributed to the Roslyn um, uh, discussions uh, on the C sharp well, on the C sharp lang uh, repo. Uh, I found it to be a little bit frustrating sometimes, um, but what was kind of interesting, and <laughs> I'm not sure I could, should take credit for this, but um, when I first built LanguageX, I put a list of uh, about six or seven things, uh, which were what I didn't like about C Sharp and what I'm trying to fix. And it was things like null, lack of tuples, that type of stuff. And one by one, they've all been ticked off by the C-sharp language team. Now, I can't claim any credit for that, obviously. I, I'm sure they're smart enough to come up with this on their own. Um, but uh, it was nice to see that these things are being ticked off one by one. And now that we've got um, uh, kind of uh, switch expressions, which was a big bugbear of mine, uh, we've got um, uh, kind of expression uh, bodied members, um and potentially uh um uh discriminated unions coming as well uh we're very close to being able to kind of um uh, expression everything the one place where you can't do expressions just yet uh is where you want to declare a new variable you go var x equals whatever that's always a statement right now um if you look at how it's done in f sharp you can't do let x equals 100 on its own it must always be followed by something and that's because let is done as a uh, like a lambda right so if you imagine a lambda that takes uh, takes an argument x um and that's that's everything after the let and then it's the lambda is invoked with the value that you you're assigning to the value so uh, sorry assigning to the variable so let's say you had let x equals 100 uh, x plus x right as 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 a, uh, an expression, that would be a lambda with x, uh, lambda arrow x plus x, invoked with 100, right? So it still becomes uh, still becomes an expression. Uh, and so it's more like um, um, kind of expression, um, oh, what's the word? You're, you're just replacing the terms x in the expression with the value, right? That's effectively what's happening. And so if we think of it like that, then we when we use a sequence of vars, and actually I did it earlier uh, in, in here, uh, in uh, one of the first examples, where is it? Yeah, here, so we've got var, var, return, right? By the way, unit is so that we're always returning a value. Um, but these two vars work a little bit like let in F sharp. Right, and there's no real way of getting around that just yet. You you could do a switch expression on a value, 
which is what you want to set to your value, and then just have one single pattern match, which matches on var x to do a you know an expression uh, based uh, declaration of uh, sorry um, variable declaration. But yeah, that's just over the top, right? Um, but yeah, I, I I'm hoping and I I think that LanguageX has put a certain amount of um, pressure or, or at least weight behind the idea that there are enough people trying to do functional style programming in C sharp, and so that's likely to to make the the uh, C sharp language designers think about this stuff a little bit more. They've always said that they will only implement features that's going to have the, the most uh, impact across the community. And so if, if, so if they don't see anybody writing functional code, then they're not going to give any functional features. Um, sorry, what's that, binding a value to a name? I don't, I don't understand that question, uh, Florian. Yeah, um, Florian. Yeah, could you explain it? Could you explain your question, please? Um, I don't know if you can unmute. No, uh, just one. Yeah. Yeah, I still don't quite understand. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what that's relating to. Sorry, Florian. That's important. And just um, um, when we were talking, uh, you said you you were missing word about uh, ass assigning uh, x. Uh, I don't yeah, didn't so, quite uh, quite understand. So bar x equals one hundred is is a statement, right? That's a statement, and therefore we can't use it in an expression. But in in uh, in F sharp, for example, you can you can do a let x equals one hundred halfway through an expression to create a kind of local value, uh, and then the rest of the expression um, is so something like uh, so if I've got var uh, x equals one hundred and then uh, x uh, plus x as the the, res, the rest of the expression, then in, uh, that would become that's what that looks like in, in F sharp, right? It gets converted into a lambda, which creates a local context, um, and so you you that's hard to do in, in C sharp. It would be pretty ugly. The the other way of doing it is where you would say um, one hundred switch. Uh, you 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 could then use uh, the switch expression to declare a variable in line. Now I wouldn't advise that at all, right? I mean it's crazy, uh, but you can see that uh, that the, the kind of capability already exists in C sharp to do this. They just haven't quite got the the, the grammar or the syntax there to do it. What what I'd like to say see is something like x equals x, um, sorry x equals uh, 100 and then maybe a comma after it or something like that uh, and then you can just do x plus x and it'd be a single expression um, but you know that's that's the only thing that's kind of missing from language uh, so from c sharp that means that you can't use expressions for everything and so if you look at the the example on, on the on the screen um, you'll see that i've had to create two vars there as two statements not two expressions so i hope i hope that's uh hope that's explained it um okay i think probably i need to wrap it up now so uh yep thank you very much thank you very much paul it was really really interesting plenty of uh, great thinking and great insights or from my side at least <laughs> and yeah. i think it's shared from <laughs> it's shared in the audience otherwise if i wouldn't have we would have the the connected but yeah, thank you. Thanks again. Thanks, thanks really. Thanks everyone to be uh, to be there today. 
and don't miss the next event. It will be on, on the 9th of, uh, of November. We welcome uh, another great guy named, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> named Nick Tune. Nick Tune. Uh, yeah, Nick, Nick is really great. It's a really great guy and he's an expert in, uh, in, D, in the DDD community. He will talk to us about um, how domain driven design and team topologies can be, can relate to each other. He will explain really cool stuff about it. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. I have followed this uh, training about it. It's really, really good. So don't miss it. And thanks again, Paul. It was really great. We'll publish the, uh, the uh, video during the, during the day. And yeah, it was the first time for us to have a DJ in, uh, <laughs> in our meetup. So thanks again. <laughs> Magician, yeah. Thanks Thank again. You, Thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye. Yeah.